let anybody know the real classified. I stumbled onto it a couple of times, but I will ignore that part of it. We were there to keep people away from the classified, and they didn't want us to know any more than we needed to know. Mm -hmm. So there was places that, well, I'll get into that over, over here. Okay, we're, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with Dick Mingus. Uh, Dick's been a longtime supporter, former staff person at the National Atomic Test Museum. He worked at the test site for many years, and he's a really remarkable um, store of historic knowledge because he was one of the very <coughs> early people who worked at what's known as Area 51. Everybody has an interest in that. So, Dick, you were, you were just telling me some real interesting stories from the very, very early days, back 1957, you said. Yes, uh, I started there. Uh, I was hired and reported to work in a training program, uh, which would have been February 11, 1957. And I went through training, and then the training was very good. It was uh, more books than anything else. It was learn what's expected of security. Then, of course, we went, to, the training included the uh, um, rifle range, the pistol range, and that type of thing, plus the uh, um, test site procedures. And that was what the training was. It was uh, very militaristic uh, in, in its way. And, but we were all civilians, but we were militaristic. We wore our uniforms in a proper way, and, and it was that way. It was a very good organization. It was a company called Federal Services Incorporated. And the uh, schedule that was posted for uh, Area 51, which there was no Area 51 at that time. Well, what did they, we, what did they call it? What name did they use? We referred to it as Delta. Delta. And on the schedule, we didn't have uh, station numbers. We were just assigned Delta. So if the Mercury people needed to contact us, They'd contact us through the Delta, through Delta, and it worked. It was very uh, sensitive uh, program, and I didn't realize how sensitive it was until uh, we got an assignment to go to Delta on a Monday morning, which took about two weeks of training. Anyway, we took the schedule, went to. Area 51, there was a sergeant assigned to us, and there was four of us in the vehicle, three, of, three guards and a sergeant. And when we pulled into Area 51, we were met at the uh, Area 51 entrance, which wasn't a gate, no. We, the, uh, it was a compound just right by where the hangars and the admin building was, and they stopped us there, and it was a, a plainclothes individual stopped us, and he, he, then he called in, then the uh, supervisors come out to uh, talk with us, and uh, took us over to a uh, hangar they called a theater. And in this theater, they gave us a briefing, a security briefing. Before we did anything else, we were had to go through this briefing. And as we were leaving, this CIA agent that stopped us, he says, this program here is more, more classified than your atomic bombs. And that was the only thing that we knew, we were into something classified, but not knowing what. I could see these airplanes sitting there, but 
I had never seen, I'd spent four years in the Air Force, but I'd never seen these planes before because they were small planes, but huge wings. And so never thought much about it. And so we go to the hangar and uh, the CIA agent in charge of security gave us a, a briefing, which was kind of blunt, but to the point. He says, what you gentlemen will be seeing here is something that you will never ever talk about. Even while you're here at the base, we can only discuss it lightly. The uh, planes that you see is uh, uh, weather record reconnaissance. And those were the early U-2 that you were He didn't at. tell us that. He didn't use... He didn't know that at the time. No. That was, that was the U-2, but it was referred to as an article. You never use the word U-2. You never use the word take off or landing. And you have to be careful the way you talk because this, we don't refer to as, this place as a base. And you have got a lot of responsibilities. You, anybody coming in here, they got to come through you guys, and we're we're behind you all the way. But anything you see here, and you ever tell outside, you can spend ten years in jail or ten thousand dollars, and we mean it. But what did it look like at that time? I mean, it was just some hangers and you two okay, sitting there around. Was, oh, three or four hangers, military style hangers, and a administrative building that was um, not a very fancy building. It was a uh, um, building made of uh, plywood and uh, uh, two before. It's just uh, kind of like a building put on a little bit of a uh, raise. You walk up a couple of steps to get there. But uh, then uh, it's uh, uh, just an admin building, we call it. And uh, there's a, it was a cafeteria that was two trailers put together, I believe it was. And some trailers set up back for overnight st staying for the uh, people that come out of California, which we learned later. And it was very much like a ranch. It's an odd thing to say because it was an area that was open for free for cattle to run free. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it actually was a ranch. The there was a, an occasion. The uh, Cowboys would go, come in to want to check the cattle, and they would be coming maybe from uh, Alamo or someplace like in there where their ranch was, and they'd come a horseback, and the uh, AEC, which AEC then would provide an escort for those people to go in and look up their cattle, and they would come in, uh, they'd all do it by horseback. and. So it, you hear the people talk about it as the ranch. It was a ranch. Is that where that nickname came from? Do you think? Ha, has to be, has to be, and it was um, open country, and the only thing that was out there was uh, uh, that little small base, and we had uh, perimeter control at the gate seven hundred that was controlled by then federal services, then uh, the uh, gate over that came in out of Alamo, there was a road over there that uh, we had a guard on we called 400. And, but 400 then operated with our people coming over. And uh, the uh, only security at that point were 
Federal Services Incorporated, supervised by the CIA. And it was a very, very, very good organization. It was well managed. They didn't overdo anything, but nothing was underdone. We all was given our assignments and just doing. We had no problems. It was, it was a great place, I'll put it that way. Did you, at that time, know, the public didn't know about it. Did you ever have any problems with, like, the public trying to get in there or anything related to that? Never had trouble with the public trying to get in. Uh, I was working the, the patrol one day, and the observation tower guard called me. He says, I see a convoy of four or five vehicles coming in to bypass the uh, barricade over on the windmill road. And about that instant, the CIA officer called me real quick. He says, go stop those people and hold them wherever they are and call me. So I go up, I get these people stopped, pulled over, and they hadn't got to the point where they could see the aircraft yet, but they were getting too close. And uh, I got them stopped and called it in. I got their IDs and called it in. And there was, he says, stand by. So we waited for probably five minutes or more called me back, he says, turn those people around and escort them off and secure that barricade, period. That was program ended. Anyway, the, the person that was in charge of me, I'm hesitant to, to say what rank he had, it was a military convoy. And he says, what do you have over there? And all I could tell him, I said, sir, you don't have the need to know. And I was talking to a high-ranking individual as the United States have. I'll put it that way. Was he intentionally trying to get on the base, or was he just lost? Or? He was, well, I don't think they thought anything was over there because they'd, we had a, a program that was uh, close by called Project 57. It was a, a, a deal, or AEC program. It was a, a planned uh, nuclear experience, experiment. And it was, that was, run, by the, it was run by the military. Yeah. It was a military AEC program. So they would have come over to see what that program is. So their nose is getting to them, I guess, they're getting nosy. What's on the other side of that barricade? So this high-ranking individual says, okay, go through there. You ought not to have done that. <laughs> but then they didn't know what was on, because they never did get through. But that would be the reasoning them being even close. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine by the time they got back to Washington, they won't do that again. <laughs> that, that Project 57, wasn't that where they experimented with dispersing plutonium to simulate an accident or something? Yes. And that was, was that actually in the Area 51 area or near it? It was near Area 51. Uh, it was in an area that you go beyond Project 57, you was in uh, 51. Uh, it was in the um, Air Force bombing range. If you look at the big map, you see uh, it was off the test site, off the Nevada test site, on the bombing range, but not in Area 51 territory. Mm -hmm. It was a very close... Very close. Uh, yes. But there was a little bit of a... 
a small mountain, I won't say a mountain, but a high spot where you couldn't see from Project 57 into Area 51. Mm -hmm. It was a, maybe another five miles out. Mm -hmm. Was there a paved runway in those early days, or was it just the dry lake bed for Area 51? There was a small runway off the uh, dry lake that ran past the uh, um, admin building that we were talking about. And it was, I don't know what it would have been. <coughs> I'd have to guess maybe half a mile long, maybe longer, I don't know. But they used that a lot of times for takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but yeah, we had a little, uh, and it was, the dry lake was used an, an awful lot too. Mm -hmm. But they did have a, 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 and that all was built by Rico. Because mm -hmm. Rico built the hangars and those buildings that we were using at that time. And the, uh, uh, there was no other contractors out there at that time. Uh, Rico was the only contractor, because uh, we didn't have a fire department. Uh, I suppose if we'd had a fire, we'd had to use the Rico firemen, but we didn't ever, they never came out to check, but if we had to make a call, they would have probably had to come out. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, well, it would have had to have been that way. Um, communications with, uh, like the radios that we used, um, Rico would, could send over a, uh, a repairman to, or somebody to take care of our radios. I, I had heard a story that Rico dug one of the first wells in that area, and they were having a horrible time. And as a joke, they called it Watertown. Did you ever hear that name, Watertown? That was a word that was never allowed to be used. Why they, I, I don't know. The word Watertown. I, I've heard a lot of different stories of that, I, that term. I, I really can't answer that. I, I don't know. It was before me. Okay. Because the only thing that they ever mentioned about Watertown that was refer referring it to Area 51, which Area 51 we couldn't use either. That was Delta. And uh, Watertown, it was a no-no. I don't know what it was. Okay. That, that's interesting because that's one of the legends and lore. You hear those different terms. D did you ever hear the term Area 51? No. We were not. So that if came I heard much it, later. I would have never repeated it. It was... Just known as Delta. It was Delta. Okay. My supervisors were never permitted on Delta. Other than that sergeant who was on duty with us. Mm -hmm. That's how tight it was. So it was a very small group of people. They come in on one or two airplanes, then they'd go home on Friday afternoon. Then they'd leave us with a skeleton crew. It was, they didn't fly back and forth to Las Vegas. There was no Las Vegas flights at all. Okay. They came out of Burbank. And earlier in, before I started out there, that a plane crash, crash on Mount Charleston that killed the first crew. And then they had to regroup. And then with the second group, they opened it up to the point where they hired contract security. And that was that had to be in 55, 56, because he had to get, get some people cleared to do the job. And that was when I got notified in, it was either 19, um, it was either June, June or July of uh, 1956, to, I applied for clearance, and only knowing it was for NTS, didn't know it was for <coughs> anything other than <coughs> NTS security. Now you mentioned there was a period after that that uh, after the U-2 testing I assume where they just kind of left for a while because there was so much atmospheric testing right next door. Well we um, 
when when I started out out there, with the uh, there was no atmospheric testing or any testing taking place at at the test site. They, the uh, the test site itself was the forward areas under construction to build some towers and um, winch filter, uh, uh, shelters and a winch that would raise a balloon to so it could have a balloon shot. The, so that, that was bombs up high. Yeah, so they could take it up 12 or 15 other feet, whatever they wanted. So they had to build the uh, winches to let that stuff up. And all that stuff was under construction. So it wasn't until, I, I, I don't know the date anymore, but it seemed to me like it was probably late June, maybe the 1st of July, they could start doing the first test. Then Area 51, or Delta, was packaging up everything so they could move. But they didn't move until we had a few of the shots. They didn't like the evacuation that they had to go through. So they packaged everything up, moved away, didn't tell us where. And the, uh, my job, I was replaced by uh, Air Force police. My sergeant re was replaced by an Air Force captain. And they had a, a few weeks training with us. Then they were, once they took the aircraft and gone, then the, the base was closed. Everything was gone and it was turned back over to RICO for uh, uh, somebody to keep an eye on the place so it wouldn't be destroyed. We left a guard at gate 700 and 400. So we had the perimeter closed, but that was it. And you said a caretaker came in and just it looked was, after the buildings for a period when it was kind of shut down. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I'm not sure of the names anymore, but it was a, a man and a woman lived there, and the guards would go check on them once a, once a day to see that everything was okay. But they were caretakers, like you say, of the uh, facility and never had a problem. Uh, during the uh, nuclear tests, uh, that was still a no-fly zone. Uh, and uh, the we would be uh, doing an air sweep. And during the air sweep, we, we could come up Papoose Lake area, but not over to fly over uh, uh, Groom Lake itself. Groom Lake. So it, it stayed to a great extent a restricted area, but uh, that was a no-fly zone for years. So you then went over to the test site and worked there for many years during nuclear testing days. Yes, my employment, like I was saying earlier, was with Federal Services Incorporated. Federal Services had the prime contract for um, Nevada test site security for uh, uh, Nevada and Tonopah. So I would work NTS security, the same as the other guards, and then we would have we had a program in uh, at Tonopah that uh, we'd work also uh, on a 24-hour basis. So, did you? And there's not very many people still living that actually saw some of the early atmospheric shots. Did you? Did you get to actually watch any of those? But most, well, almost all of them that was above ground, uh, I, I've got to, to witness. Um, the uh, the bombs themselves, we we had very close contact with 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 those bombs. They were turned over to security to control, and <clears throat> the uh, bombs that would be put on a, a tower, 
Security would escort the bombs to the tower, put them on, a, put them on an elevator, take them to the cab of the tower, which may be 500 or 700 feet up, be two guards at, at that tower 24 hours a day. And the uh, shot day, we'd, federal service would clear the area completely. The arming party would come by and pre-arm the bomb or arm the bomb at the tower or the, uh, the if it was a balloon shot on the ground. And then we'd leave the area secured uh, to distance requested by the uh, uh, Atomic Energy Commission. And we would secure all the way back to within about a mile and a half of two uh, control, control point, CP1. And uh, we'd have one patrol uh, over on the uh, Area 12 side, which would be uh, northeast, gate 700, if it was most of the shots, we would clear that area by air sweep, making sure nobody was over there. And that would be, I'm going to correct myself just a little bit, on, on part of the shots, we would leave 700 on, on post, move him back a mile or two back and control it. But if it was something that was going to be a more delicate or dangerous, I should say, oh, 700 might be deactivated, and with depending on making sure that air sweep made sure there was nobody uh, in Area 51 was cleared completely, and the guard at 400 would have been deactivated, and all of that would have been air air swept. <coughs> now, the uh, you ask me if I witnessed them, the hood shot, which was the biggest above ground shot that was detonated at the Nevada test site. I'd done the air sweep and come back to the checkpoint, which we was called gate so you three. You were up in an airplane looking down on the ground. Yes, and it was all clear. So when we got done with that, I went back to, uh, I landed in Indian Springs, of course. Then I go back to uh, my job, which was help control the forward area. And uh, the I got there in time to watch the shot from gate 300, the checkpoint. The shot was huge. The whole mountainside was a fire. And about a half hour went by, and the uh, part of the area that was red safe had went in to check to see um, radiation as to where it would be safe to open up part of the uh, forward area. And I got a call from my sergeant. He asked me, he says, stop by Rad Safe, pick up a Geiger counter and find somebody else in a, in a separate vehicle, come out to, and check with me at building 23. And that was about, uh, that would have been about seven or eight, maybe nine miles out. So I went to Rad Safe, got me a Geiger counter and got a hold of a guard by the name of Mr. Falburn, and we go out, separate pickups, talk to the sergeant, and he looked at me. He says, where I'm sitting is not very pleasant. He says, roll up the, vehicle, the uh, windows in your pickups, and the road is going to be, it's probably going to be, have rocks and stuff on it because you're going to go through ground zero. You've got to go to Delta. 
you set up a roadblock, a Delta controlling access to the Nevada test site from Delta. And he says, find a, an area that, that what you can find with the least amount of radiation and try to set up there as long as you can have observation clear enough to make sure that you're controlling the test site. And that's what us two guys did. And going across that, my Geiger counter was reading, I'm not going to tell you how much, but it was beyond what was permitted for human beings. And it was, was bad. But stayed there all day. The least amount of radiation I could find was about 50 to 60 MR. So was there some sort of issue you were sent there? I mean, did they, were they worried, obviously, about somebody coming from Area 51 into the area? Well, I had Area 51 covered. So you were blocking we were, that. We, were, we, we could cover that entire uh, east side of the test site and north side from where we were. We, it was a, Area 51, it was, if you're there, you could see for miles. Mm -hmm. And so we, we could control it from where we were. And um, it was just a very, probably the most delicate assignment you're ever going to get. But I got a few of those, which was okay. It's, uh, I'm, I'm proud to do it. I really was. It's something that had to be done. Yes, it was tough. You told me a really interesting story. There was one close call uh, before you mentioned maybe it was the plum bob shot where there was uh, somebody that wasn't where he was supposed to be right before the, the test, and they, they caught it in the last few minutes. <clears throat> oh, the uh, guard station 700 was the location at, at that time of that station was uh, on the northeast end of Area 10 before you go over the uh, uh, mountain into the uh, Papoose Lake and Groom Lake area, which included 51. Uh, so it was an ideal location for the guard point, guard station. He could observe all of Yucca Valley from where that location was. So the, uh, we was down, I don't remember the exact count anymore, but down about probably minus two minutes on detonation of uh, the shot. It was a balloon shot, it would have been 1,500 feet up. And the guard calls in to control. He says, you probably need to hold the shot because I see a, v a vehicle around ground zero. Ground zero at that point was a balloon at about 1,500 feet with, with a bomb on it. Mm -hmm. So the control right now, they put, put the stop on it. The guards were sent, I don't know who, who was sent in to escort those people out. And it was two uh, GIs that had bypassed the barricade coming up from uh, Papoose Lake. And that was part of the bombing range. And so we got the shot stopped before the uh, bomb went. That would have been the first. We never lost anybody at the test site due to a detonation. That was one thing. Federal Services was a very, very good contractor to work for. We were told to do a job. And by God, you better do it. Right. And they were good to us, and we all did it, never lost anybody. So that so, was one of the closest calls, though. That may have been as close as it would ever get. Mm -hmm. We, yeah, we, there were some people got contaminated, but that wasn't, that was due to uh, events after we got rid of uh, uh, above ground testing, went to underground testing. Mm -hmm. And you, um, one thing I want to catch on, uh, you had the great pleasure of working with Troy Wade, one of the museum's founders, uh, 
you know, Troy is such a nice guy to get along with, and you told some wonderful stories. Uh, probably want to get on tape here your impression of Troy, and uh, I know you two worked together at one point. Troy, I, I met Troy back probably back in 1958. Troy was a, pretty much a new hire. I hadn't been around too many years myself, and uh, we had a it was on a project that was very res restricted access. And uh, Troy was a working for Reynolds Electric, and not as a high a high position. He was kind of a I would say a grunt like me, but we were on a project that was very very delicate. Uh, we were there at the request of President Eisenhower. And uh, it was a clearance that was granted to some of us again that uh, um, even our supervisors weren't allowed access. When I went over there to work, I said, you, don't, you, you work over with us, you won't have any supervisors ex except us, and that was Livermore Laboratory people, so people. So I was working under supervision of Lawrence Livermore Lab, of their nuclear test coordinators. That were they were my bosses, and Troy worked for RICO, and th that was the beginning of getting me getting to know Troy, and. Troy then, like I say, he worked with the, with the grunts getting the job done. And then Troy, being Troy, there's only one Troy, believe me, he was liked by the people who was running the, uh, we called it the 410 area at that time. And they were under construction of a, of a new building that later was called 5310. And the, the man who was running that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of guessing on her name, but I believe I'm right. Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it just a second. Uh, anyway, Chuck Meyer, I'll say, I will say it. Chuck Meyer was his name. And he liked Troy, and he hired Troy to go to work for uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab. Then Troy then took over the project of, uh, in the uh, building of that. The building was pretty much complete, but Troy then uh, supervised the building of the bombs for the Nevada test site. And I got promoted a little bit later too, and then I became uh, the sergeant who was covering the building of the bombs. So the Troy- assembly. The assembly, in the uh, assembly building? The uh, assembly building of 5310. Okay. And Troy was in charge of that, and if a security problem came up, many times Troy would call me to help him out with it, because being Troy, Everything is going to be done as quiet as we can, but it will be done right. Troy was a very strict person, but Troy was a person that didn't ever like to have people angry. He wanted a very pleasant place to work. Mm -hmm. And when you're building bombs and in, a day, in an area sensitive as that is, that is a good sized chore because there's a, so much responsibility knowing that if something happens at 5310, somebody by chance gets in there to get one of those bombs, the guard orders, as I understand them, that nobody gets the bomb. So if you've been taken hostage, you're probably going to die. It had to be a tremendous responsibility. 
So the, the guards had a big job. They all knew it. And I knew it especially because I did it for many, many months, coming in, taking care of it. We did not have any major problems. Every one of those guards, if they had a problem, we took care of it, which occasionally there's going to be a little miss. Uh, not a big mistake, but, you know, somebody doing something mm -hmm. wrong. But between Troy and I, we cleaned it up without uh, any more problems and absolutely had to be done. Uh, most fantastic man that I ever knew. I know he was identified as a natural-born leader. Everybody said that from the early was. stage. He was. Now, he, he did an interview, and he did talk about an area that has since been declassified. During the moratorium, he worked uh, on high explosives. They weren't nuclear bombs, but they were, they were blowing up large amounts of explosives to simulate what a nuclear bomb would do because it was during the moratorium and they couldn't blow bombs up. Now, Troy's put that on record. Okay, then that was where I met Troy. Okay, so that That's was what done I was, at Area That was what I was talking about earlier. Okay. He did include that in his oral Yeah, history. I didn't know. I, I, I wouldn't bet that that uh, had been declassified, but Troy would know that being declassified. But he that was about it. So. That was it. Yeah. And that, yeah, that was a touchy place, and Eisenhower put that on. Right. During the moratorium, yeah, 57 yes. to 60 something, yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So that, you really, <coughs> you were in the middle of a lot of historic events. I, I was very fortunate. I've seen a lot of stuff out there. And as he knows, I never talk much about it. Because most people just, which I was an ordinary guard. But we got exposed and had knowledge of, to be honest with you, everything that was taking place at the site. Mm -hmm. Everything that was going on, both for Los Alamos and Livermore, we knew what was going on. You saw things behind the scenes. Yeah. It was, yeah, it, it, it's an awkward thing. The security guard usually never got credit for anything, which they didn't do much as far as physical work, but how much stuff we protected. Mm -hmm. So much. And that area that Troy's talking about, um, that was, that was a biggie. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked without supervision. I didn't have a supervisor over there. Nor, well, Rico had a, a superintendent over there, but he didn't have any uh, uh, other than himself, probably going around telling them what to do because <coughs> the uh, Livermore uh, engineers would be controlling it. Mm -hmm. so, was there ever even any hint of like Soviet spies or espionage? I know you were always on the guard for that and you probably never know what you actually prevented, but uh, were there any stories related to that? If it, if it was, it never came down really to us. They, uh, we always were worried about protesters, of course, mm -hmm. and um, now that came a little bit later, though, right? Yes. Like well, we actually had protesters during uh, uh, Operation Plum Bob. Okay. It goes Better, back. Okay. Goes back quite a ways, and uh, they protested at the main gate, and. Uh, It was, that was before they built that uh, uh, corral, I guess we call it, mm -hmm. downstairs, down uh, across from uh, Desert Rock. So some of them came in, uh, was really concerned about it. Uh, the FBI had called and our people had, uh, was concerned, watch out for the protesters. Uh, one of the people that's coming in He's a communist that we want to, if we can get him arrested, we're going to try it. Did you ever hear of Gus Hall? Yeah. He'll be, he'll, he'll be coming in in a 
Green, uh, who, what, who, Hudson. And if you see this car coming in, we're going to get, we want him. So he showed up, but he didn't get close enough to where we could get him. Mm -hmm. But he showed up for the uh, uh, Adam Lopers, we called them. And if you look back in the history book, if it's written, that protest was called Adam Lopers. Okay. So that was one of the early ones. That was the early, that was the first one. First one, okay. Yeah. They were stopped at the main gate. Okay. And they gave me a, a nasty little chore of it up from the parking lot and out in the desert between uh, the main gate and uh, the mountain. They want you to go up and there's some low spots in there and if somebody might be sneaking in, <coughs> we want you up there. So that was, uh, that was where I was at and I didn't have a problem. Did you go out in a Jeep or I walked on up. foot? Okay. On I walked foot. up with the, uh, had my radio and that was all I needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't have any problem. And on, on the new road that was under construction, to go from Jackass, from the main gate to uh, Jackass Flats uh, Project Rover. That was under construction. And we had a motor patrol on that. Okay. And that was a pretty secret project. Yes. We have an exhibit in the museum on that. Um, yeah, so I worked pro uh, Project Rover too. You were on that too? Yeah, we rotated that uh, on, on, the, on the guard force. Okay. Now, is that where you met Joe Beanie? You had some stories about him, or was that later? No, um, I, I just knew Joe from the test site, but not knowing him well, because I worked, I went downtown, and they wanted me to work downtown for, as an area sergeant, and, and I worked, and that was when I got to know Linda Smith and some of that bunch. Mm -hmm. I worked downtown, changing repositories and there was bomb threats that we have, we're getting quite a bunch, but um, I'd evacuate areas out and uh, AG&G was getting quite a few bomb threats at that time. And it was, it's kind of delicate to talk about, which I won't c cover all of it, but uh, the, uh, I got a call from Mr. Miller. He was the uh, manager to go out and evacuate uh, EG&G &G at sunset. We got a bomb threat out there. He says, "You take care of it." His words. He was he was the uh, Donald Trump of uh, DOE. <laughs> he, he tell you something. You you he better get to work. <laughs> anyway, when I got that call, I headed out and I got the building and everything cleared out and uh, no problem, everything was okay. It was Anyway, we'd been out for maybe a half an hour. We had a, a time it was supposed to go, but it didn't. And uh, the uh, EG&G &G manager, he says, I'm gonna send my people in. I said, no, no. We're going to check the area. He says, I want to, I got to get my telephone people in. I says, we're going to sweep the area. Because when, when Mr. Miller sent me out, I, I've got a job to do. Right. You got to make sure and, there's and no Nobody going to get in my way now. <laughs> and, and I'm an easy guy to get along with. But now I, I'm going to be difficult or, or I'm going to get fired. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I says, I looked at the guy because I knew basically what to do. I said, I'd like you to, you got several left different departments in here. You send a guy or two in each one of those departments that know the area could recognize any kind of an explosive. And then if we get it all clear, then we'll open it up. But that, those telephones let them ring. And so you, you had to be in charge of that bomb disposal, you had to make sure there was no bomb in that building. Yeah, I had gone through bomb training school at the uh, 
army had put off. And that was, I guess, one of the reasons that uh, Miller wanted me to do that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, you, I learned real quick at those bomb training schools, you're wasting your time because you're almost not ever going to spot it. Just if it's really hit. Yeah. So it's, you, if you're going to check an area, the only person to really check it would be let him check in here mm -hmm. because the clerk in the, in the office down there wouldn't know. Right. That was what we, that's the way we did it. Right. So I, I got some pretty good responsibilities. I'll do it again. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just conclude because uh, we're kind of, we're actually having a lecture tonight on Area 51 and you're going to get to see T.D. Burns again, and I know you two knew one another, although you didn't actually work together. No, that's right. But what do you think, what do you think about all the modern craze about Area 51? I mean, there's so much, you know, nonsense and stuff that goes on. I mean, what, what's your reflection? Well, it's, Area 51 is an extremely important place. Now, I'm going to, uh, I agree completely with what they're doing, but it's run by the military now. It's an Air Force base today. It's an Air Force base controlled by the military. When I was out there, it was a spy base controlled by CIA. And that is the difference. And some of the people that were out there when I was there stayed on with the U2 program that CP or that CD got to know. But the, I doubt if even CD even knew there was a Area 51 when I was out there. Mm -hmm. And it, and I'm not cutting him back, but it, it just didn't happen. There was no place like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with him being a radar man, he might have picked up airplanes coming in because the people that came in from Burbank didn't fly over Las Vegas. They didn't fly over Mercury. They came in over north of Nevada test site and back in uh, by Flat Top Mountain, then back in um, closer by Rachel, and then down into uh, Area 51. And if you look at the map, it, they'd come in skirting the, uh, the test site because mm -hmm. that was a no-fly zone, and Area 51 didn't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how are you going? How are you going to say that? Mm -hmm. Well, you lived through some remarkable history, and uh, as you said, you know uh, the documented history of Area Fifty One. It's it's an amazing, and important history. They did important work out there, uh, <coughs> and undoubtedly continue to this day to do to do work. Well, the um, Fifty One people come in. You know, they. You had to know it after you worked out there a while. They didn't use their name. We knew that. It was, you didn't have to be around too long to kind of figure that out. But we all knew that that's okay. Because when they land, we'd come out and make sure that they got our badges. And anything else that they had there had to take back with them. And so we knew who they weren't. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was kind of awkward, but we knew, we knew, we knew. You didn't have to be there very long, but you, but you don't ask them who they are either. Mm -hmm. Francis Gary Powers, I learned out later uh, what his name was, but Frank. You didn't know it at the time. Frank. Mm -hmm. That's all we knew. Mm -hmm. We didn't care. It didn't make any difference. Why would I need to know his name? I'm never going to see him again. Who cares anyway? He's got a job to do. I got a job to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other ones was was the same. And uh, it, you know, there's there's stories in 
stories that, like you just asked that one uh, that just pop up once in a while that now how do you explain that one like I got quizzed one time because of uh, the book that's out that Annie wrote that I went down and got into this hangar well on that that hangar was a there was only about half a dozen names that could have access to that hangar. And this was a real a weekend. It was maybe a Saturday or Sunday. I'm making my patrol. And if I make a patrol, every door is going to be locked or I'm going to find it open. And I grabbed this big hangar door and I gave it a big yank. I cut it open. And that's the building I'm not supposed to be in. And I'm thinking for a second, I'm not, I, I, I'm not supposed to go in there. But we didn't have radios then, personal radios. My pickup, I parked it up about 100 yards away. I also know I can't leave an area that's open unattended. So I stood by this door for, it must have been a couple, maybe five minutes, I don't know. I'm thinking, well, there's probably a phone in there. I can, and I know the phone is going to ring over to the admin building because there are no outside phones. <coughs> so I go in. Well, I'd have been in there about 30 seconds and I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. It was obvious. So anyway, I found that phone and I called over and told them where I was at. And they, first, said, how'd you get in? I says, I opened the door. And so stay there, we'll be right there. So they came over. And first they were questioning me because you're not allowed in here. Well, what you gonna do? I, I can't make myself invisible. And so it was a CIA guy, the agent looked at me, he says, I'm gonna to have to give you a debriefing. Okay. So we went off to ourselves, and I got to, he told me, he says, you did exactly right. You did exactly thing. He says, you know the guy that didn't make sure that this door wasn't properly secure has got a problem. He's the one that's in trouble. <laughs> he says, appreciate what you did. And he says, we'll make some repairs on the door. And he says, thank you. But he had to tell me that I would go to jail if I tell what's in this hangar. And I still haven't told a soul what's so in that hangar. Told. You, you may live to be an old man of me too, but I ain't going to tell you. <laughs> well, we, we should note that you assisted Annie Jacobson uh, in her book. It's one of our best-selling books in our museum store to this day. Uh, and it's a great book. If somebody wants to read a good story, a good book about Area 51, you've, a lot of your stories were incorporated in her accounts. It, it, it is to a degree. I had to make sure they were clean. Right. Uh, and that was something that, uh, that she, she was good at. Uh, if something that she was talking about was NTS involved, she knew to talk to, to the PIO guy. Mm -hmm. and. Of course, I, I knew too, and I, I said, we aren't going to cover anything classified because I won't do that because it's too important. But we can get to the, discuss the things that are important and serious. Uh, and we, you know, we talked about the uh, simulated test guards that gave over at uh, uh, 5310. The guards got fired over that. Uh, but it had already happened and uh, it was a very serious thing. Troy had a, an office in the Pentagon and he heard about it too. It, we were told 
I, I question whether it's true or not, but uh, Reagan raised the subs to launch depth over that because if somebody had the bomb, we may be in serious trouble. So Reagan had put the uh, subs at launch depth. I don't know that. I was told that. I don't know how true it is. <coughs> you might want to check that tape before it's released, too, okay. on that. I don't know. Okay. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, because it was serious stuff. Because when I, when I reported it, I got the call from the device systems engineer. And uh, he says, I can hear the gunshots from, from the uh, uh, radios of the, of the guards that's right by me. He says, I can hear the gunshots. So he says, something's going on. So I knew it was something bad. So I've got a job to do because I'm forward area security officer for Livermore. And I work for the test director, of course. So I'm lucky right now the test director's with me. So uh, Joe is like me to you. I told him what I have. He says, oh my God. I, but I says, I, I know my procedures. I says, do you want me to carry it on? And he says, do your job. That's Joe. So I Joe called B. the manager, told him what I had. He said, oh, Larry Ferdurber. And Larry says, oh my God. He says, you sure? I says, yes. I just talked to uh, Pat Williams and she uh, uh, says yes, they're being they're under attack as far as security is concerned, and that uh, Bob Terrell is over there with them. Okay. So, Ferdurber called DOE security. Then he called me back. He says I got the same story that you got. He says do your job. You know what to do. He says you got your instructions. Do it. Now, my instructions are at this point that if, if we get any more to, to verify that I know we're in, under attack, <coughs> I'm a, uh, um, I had um, all the classified in the vault to be, burn or destroy. I had crypto. I'm a, a, also a crypto custodian, had that room back there, and all that has to be destroyed, and yet I've got to keep my mouth shut. So I told Joe, and Joe just looked at me and he shook his head and he says, I hope this is not true. I says, he says, Joe says, I, I doubt it it is. I said, I doubt it too, but we don't know. So I'm did a real quick check on the keys that I had, make sure that I had the keys to get every place I needed to go. And, and, cause I was gonna have to burn crypto. That was gonna have to be, cause I told Joe, I said, we don't want another Pueb Pueblo. Mm -hmm. You know what the, mm -hmm. the, the Chinese did to mm -hmm. uh, the Pueblo. And I said, I don't wanna have to burn that down with, without cause which I was going to throw gasoline or kerosene on the, on the crypto and didn't have to do that. And finally we got the call that uh, it was a drill. It was a, dr it was a false alarm, but it, it was generated by a drill. Yeah, but nobody, see. But the word didn't I, come I that have, a drill. We know somebody made a mistake, but I didn't pass it on to us. When the DOE security don't know it, somebody d didn't pass the word. Right. Now, there's always, I, I don't always trust everybody. I think there was a bad guy in there somewhere wanting to get somebody in trouble. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you off camera. Okay. Well, <laughs> one of many, many stories, and we, we've covered a lot, and we've gone past the noon hour, so uh, what do you think, Alex? We've got some good good video here and we want to thank you for all your years of service and and a lot of years of service at the museum because you were 
you came here and worked from the very beginning for a good 10 years, wasn't it? Yeah, I got 10 plus or one, I think closer to 11, whatever, yeah. it, well, it was a long time. But So uh, you're also, a, a, we thank you for your service to the, the museum as well, and uh, you're very much appreciated by all of us here. So hopefully this will go down for the record to get some more of these stories handed down to the next generation. Well, there's, there's a thousand more stories that are still out there. Somebody asked me one time, uh, how close was you ever to one of the bombs? I said, pretty close. I said, well, I was ab above one of them. I could look down and I could see it. I said, I was probably two or three miles from it. What does it look like on, from the top? I said, well, you see this tremendous explosion and then the fireball and then, then you'll see an ice cap. He said, it looks like uh, ice or foam. And he said, it'll last for a few seconds and it's gone. Well, I told somebody this, and that was what, what it was. Anyway, come to find out, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, uh, on Nagasaki, I, should, I want to take that back. The guy that wrote the book on Nagasaki, he described what he seen the same way. Because I'd been called, called uh, not a liar, but mm -hmm. They didn't believe what I'd seen, and it was. Well, there's there's not too many people left that actually saw one of those. Uh, Ernie Williams is the only other one I know of around still that uh, with yeah. you that saw some but of those early. To see tests. one above, I'm going to guess there's probably not a half a dozen. And it has to be very unique. Yeah, because it it it's quick, and the fireball is. Huge, as scary as the Dickens, and then it looked. Evidently, it's vapor. That when it, when the moisture in the air created ice or foam or whatever it was, <coughs> and that's what you can see above it, it. It probably rises so fast it crystallizes, and you know. Yeah, you know. but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. <laughs>